not a very good time for planets, I'm afraid, but I have had quite a number of letters about that very bright thing visible in the west after sunset, and that is the planet Venus, now almost at its best. Jupiter was near it for some time, but we've lost Jupiter in the twilight now, and neither Saturn nor Mars is well placed, so as I say, not a good time for planets. But at least we've got plenty of stars, and the evening sky now is dominated by what I called the Summer Triangle in a Sky at Night program many years ago, and everyone seems to use that term now. Well, in it, there are three brilliant stars. The brightest of them is Vega in Lyra. That's a brilliant blue star, and I'm going to say a bit more about that later on. You can't mistake it. Number two is Deneb in Cygnus, which doesn't look so bright, even though it's really a great deal more luminous and further away. And then we have Altair in Aquila, the eagle, which has a fainter star to either side of it, and they make up the Summer Triangle. Uh, further over to the east, you can see the square of Pegasus coming into view. And very low down over the southern horizon, you'll be able to make out Antares, the brilliant red star in the Scorpion, a lovely sight. The Milky Way is pretty rich too, all in this area. And when you look at the Milky Way with binoculars or any telescope, you see myriads of stars. And it's so easy to imagine that those stars must be packed closely together, almost bumping into each other. But of course, that isn't so. The Milky Way is, in fact, a line of sight effect. Our galaxy is a flattened system, and when we look along the main plane, we see many stars almost in the same line, and that's what makes up the Milky Way band. All these things are conspicuous naked eye objects. But this evening, we want to talk about a branch of astronomy that we haven't discussed before in all our 21 years of the sky at night. Uh, we are dealing with invisible astronomy, those things known as gamma rays, which are really very interesting indeed. But I think to introduce it, I'd better say just a bit, once more, about what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, the whole range of wavelengths. We begin with the long wavelength radio waves, which do come from the sky, although, of course, there's no suggestion that they're artificial. Then we have the microwaves, and then we come along to infrared, and we've talked about infrared astronomy many times. And then at a shorter wavelength, we come to visible light, the light that affects your eyes and mine from red uh, down to violet. And really, you know, that visible range makes up a very small part of the total electromagnetic spectrum. Below violet light, we come to ultraviolet. Then we come to the very short penetrating X-rays, which also come from space. And then the ultra-short, highly penetrating gamma rays, which, as I say, we've not discussed before because gamma ray astronomy is pretty new. And gamma ray wavelengths really are incredibly short. So short that it's difficult to appreciate what's meant. And I think I'd like to try and give you here a kind of a scale model. So, first of all, this ruler is divided into centimeters. So each of these blue divisions is one centimeter, and each white division is one centimeter. Now, just let's take any of these, this one here if you like, and imagine that that has been increased in scale until it covers the entire uh, distance between Land's End and John O'Groats which is uh, really about a thousand kilometers. So that one centimeter has been spread out into that whole distance, Land's End right through to John O'Groats. On that scale, what's going to be the wavelength of ordinary visible light? Well, just about the real length of this ruler. Well now, let's again imagine that we go up further in scale and we take one section of this ruler, remembering that the entire ruler now represents a wavelength of light, and we spread out that tiny part of it again to Land's End to John O'Groats. How long then is a wavelength of gamma radiation going to be? And the answer is, once again, just about the real length of this ruler, which shows you how incredibly short gamma rays really are. Now, I am not a gamma ray astronomer, I don't pretend to be, so I'm delighted to reintroduce now somebody who is uh, a very regular and very welcome visitor to the sky at night, uh, Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who of course we always associate with the discovery of pulsars, even though you've done a great deal since then as well. Welcome back, Jocelyn. Thank you. Well, gamma ray astronomy is pretty new. Mm, very new, yes. Been going 20 years at the outside, even less than that. I perhaps ought to explain a, a technical term that we're likely to use in this program about gamma ray photons. As well as thinking of light and gamma rays as a wave, you can think of them as little bundles of energy, a stream of these little particles, which are called photons. And gamma ray astronomers find it rather more convenient to talk in terms of photons than to talk in terms of the wave. So if I talk about photons, I'm talking basically about the same thing, 
and I may well talk about the energy of photons rather than their wavelength. Gamma ray photons are just high energy versions of light photons. And of course gamma rays are very difficult to detect because after all they're highly penetrative and they can cross large areas of the universe without getting in the way of anything, can't they? Yes, you have to devise special techniques for detecting them. Spark chambers are the ones that we usually use. A spark chamber is made up of a whole series of metal plates, electrified, with a thick one on the top. Now, when your gamma ray arrives from space, it hits the top plate. And then it's changed into two particles, an electron and its antimatter counterpart, the positron. Now, these particles are traveling in the same direction as the original gamma ray. And as they pass between the electrified plates, they cause sparking. And these sparks can be photographed. So you get a spark trail, and that tells you a great deal about the direction and the nature of the original gamma ray which caused it. Now, we have got in the studio an actual spark chamber which very kindly lent to us by Southampton University. It's quite a thing, isn't it, Rosalind? Yes, it's bigger than you might expect, isn't it, from the diagram? Yes, indeed. It's got 70 plates in it altogether, this one. Same principle, though. We haven't got any gamma rays down here on the surface of the Earth, so we're operating on cosmic rays. Hence the squeaking, incidentally. Well, that squeaking would happen anyway. It's as the uh, charge discharges and charges up again after each spark. Interesting that this actual spark chamber has been flown in balloons several times, hasn't mm. it? This one is a veteran. It's had five flights on balloons and has been responsible for some of the first discoveries in gamma ray astronomy. Well, you certainly couldn't, take, couldn't have taken that one up on one of the earlier satellites. It's too big. No, I think the very first satellite spark chamber was about six inches cube. This size of thing really has to go on a satellite, on a balloon, or perhaps something like Space Lab, something bigger? Well, it's certainly got to be taken up, because after all, we can't study the main part of gamma radiation from down here on the Earth's surface. It's blocked out there of the Earth's atmosphere. So it has to be taken aloft. And uh, in fact, the balloons which take up uh, these spark chambers can go up to a height of something like 25 miles. And they take a long time to get there. And when they're up, they stay aloft for something like, oh, 12 to 18 hours balloon being filled with helium gas. Not very much helium, of course, but it expands as the balloon goes up. Yes, the helium's coming in through those pipes at the side, and the balloon has been laid out downwind of the telescope itself, which is being suspended from a launching vehicle. Uh, it was amazing to reflect how big that balloon is. After all, you could put St. Paul's Cathedral inside it when it's fully inflated. Yes, it's a uh, 20 million cubic foot. That dark thing is the parachute that it will come down on, this is the tricky point. The vehicle's got to manoeuvre to keep the telescope underneath the balloon and it must let go of it. It must open its jaws at just the right moment so as the telescope neither hits the ground nor the launch machine go up in the air itself. Has that ever happened, Mr. Hendler? Excuse me, there are the jaws open and the thing's taken off. There have been accidents with balloon fl flying, yes. The most dramatic one happened actually at ceiling, way 20 miles up when the main bearing gave way and the telescope fell 20 miles of free fall. Well, but disastrous results, I imagine. Right. What about the actual uh, recovery by a parachute? Is this an easy matter? I suppose it is nowadays. It's always a little bit risky that the telescope will bump along the ground as the parachute drags. This shows a telescope coming down to land. Looks rather wooded country. I hope they won't have recovery problems. Well, you seem to feel you're right there, coming down quite nicely. And, of course, I imagine now it's fairly easy to trace them all, although I did hear stories that one or two of the early balloons went out of control and were never actually found. Yes, there have been some hair-raising moments when they've nearly landed on President Johnson's ranch. And <laughs> like this. Well, now, when you sent up the balloons, uh, I think it's fair to say you don't really get very many gamma rays out of it. You have to pick, your, have to pick and choose. Yes, it's not an easy subject, and this is why it's been such a hard grind, honestly. And to complicate matters, there are an awful lot of those cosmic rays, like we were seeing yes, in exactly. the spark chamber. How do you disentangle those? You have separate uh, counters above and below the spark chamber, which will pick out the cosmic rays in preference to the gamma rays. Yes. And you work with what's left, and that's your gamma rays. But there aren't many. There's a lovely gamma ray astronomer's hymn, which gives you a very accurate picture, actually. It goes like this. Through the night of doubt and sorrow, onward goes the pilgrim band, counting photons very slowly on the fingers of one hand. <laughs> one thing I think is really rather amazing is when you consider the number of uh, gamma ray photons ever studied by all the equipment put together, it's something like a million. Yes, that's in the beginning, ever since the beginning of gamma ray astronomy. 
Well, what I find interesting is compare that with the number of light photons we receive from a star such as Vega, which I referred to earlier on when I was talking about the sky map. Every time we look at Vega, we receive something like a million light photons per second. So we really, in gamma ray photons, we've only got one second's worth, so to speak. Yes, in 20 years. Now, what about the various discrete sources? I know there's been a great deal of progress there lately. There's been progress on a lot of fronts, actually. Uh, discrete sources are perhaps most important in the context of the Milky Way, because we've known for some time that there's a band of gamma ray emission around the Milky Way. And we've presumed that that was those same old cosmic rays crashing into the hydrogen gas that's between the stars and producing gamma rays. This has been called into question recently. It's not clear how many of the gamma rays arise from that because they've discovered a number of these discrete sources embedded in the Milky Way. It's early days yet, but it could be that in fact a lot of the Milky Way emission is these discrete sources. I wonder what they are. Neutron stars, perhaps. Could well be. We'll see. You know, about 18 months ago, uh, we did a program about the famous Vela Pulsar, when it was first identified as an optical object. And I think it's always rather amazing that the Vela Pulsar is the faintest optical object ever recorded, and also, I think, the strongest gamma ray source. Yes, it is the strongest gamma ray source. Not only is it very strong, but it's almost entirely a pulsed source when you get to gamma ray wavelengths. Um, there's very, very little steady emission from it. It's rather curious that way. It's a weird thing. Then, of course, our old friend, the crab. The crab nebula always crops up in any program of this nature. Well, of course, it radiates over the whole of the electromag electromagnetic range. You get radio, optical, x-ray, and gamma ray signals from it, and pulsed in all those energy bands. And again, at gamma ray wavelengths, it's very largely pulsed. There's very little discrete emission from it. It's odd, isn't it, that the gamma ray emission from the Crab Nebula is so much the same as the gamma ray emission from the Vela Pulsar. Yes, it's almost sinister, actually. You uh, forget about their different pulse periods and plot them on the same scale, and you can see that they've got virtually the same pulse profile. There's a main pulse, a main flash, and then four-tenths of the way around to the next flash, there's the subsidiary one. And it's exactly the same in both the Crab and Vela. They're they're twins almost. Odd, isn't it? Makes you think you might be dealing with something very fundamental. What about the extragalactic sources, though? Are they the same? I'm not really, are they? No, they're not really. There aren't many of them yet, no. but I'm sure there are more to come. Uh, Southampton have detected gamma ray emission from NGC 4151. Oh, the Seifert Galaxy? This is a Seifert, yes. A weird thing with rather condensed nucleus and evidence of a large, vast explosion there in pre um, some, many some, years ago. Something violent, certainly, yes. Gamma rays from that. And gamma rays from another peculiar thing as well, Centaurus A, or NGC 5128. Yes, I remember doing a program about that many years ago, when we thought it was two colliding galaxies, because that theory has long since been thrown overboard. It's a band of dust across the centre, obscuring the nucleus in this particular case. But it gives gamma rays too, very interestingly. And I'm sure more extragalactic stuff will follow. Well, so far, we've been talking about gamma rays collected from uh, balloon-borne and satellite-borne equipment. But, of course, there is a certain amount of gamma ray astronomy that can be done from the Earth's surface, the very high energy stuff. Yes, it's not a big contribution, I, I hasten to add, but it's nice that you can do some from the Earth's surface. You need the same uh, kind of night as you need to observe your things, <laughs> clear and uh, moonless. Yes. What happens is that uh, a very high energy gamma ray comes crashing into the top of the Earth's atmosphere and produces a whole space, a whole shower of particles which pass through the atmosphere and cause it to glow just a little bit. The saving grace is that this shower of particles spreads out as it goes down through the atmosphere, and so does the light, so that you get a cone of light, a pool of light down at the surface a few hundred yards across, which helps detect it, because yes. it wouldn't be too easy otherwise. I think these gamma ray telescopes, such as the Mount Hopkins one, they're most extraordinary things. I've never seen them myself, but it doesn't look like a telescope at all. It's a 10-meter reflector, and it's made up of individual hexagons. But it is basically just a parabolic yes. mirror, you know, a big one, and it collects the light and reflects it onto the focus box. But even so, there are not very many gamma rays it does collect, surely, over one night. No, there aren't many, and there are always more cosmic rays, of yes. course. Um, to give you an idea of how few gamma rays there are in this energy range, supposing we were up at the top of the atmosphere, and we had an area of about a square meter, which is what this coffee table yes, must exactly. be, then that area at the top of the atmosphere would get one of these gamma rays every 10 days. Which isn't very much. It's not a lot to play with. Even from the crab? 
uh, from anywhere. <coughs> but the crab seems to be the main one, yes. They have detected that. They're fairly certain. Not as strongly as they might have expected. And very curiously, it seems to be variable, which would be most interesting to follow up. I wonder if there's any connection between the variations of the crab in gamma radiation and these, these strange gamma ray bursts that have been collected recently. Hard to know, because we don't really yet know what the gamma ray bursts are coming from, you know, whether they're galactic or extra galactic. What's your guess? I'm sitting on the fence, <laughs> firmly. <laughs> they're, they're interesting things. The discovery came about in a rather curious way, through some satellites called the Vela satellites, but nothing to do with yeah. the constellation, which were monitoring for uh, unofficial nuclear testing in the Earth's atmosphere. And these Vela satellites detected some uh, enhancements in, in gamma radiation, increases in counting rate. And several satellites observed them at once, so it wasn't something funny on the satellite. And they've eliminated the Earth and the Sun as the source of the radiation, although they're still not terribly good at pinpointing where it comes from. But we now have perhaps about 40 of these bursts, fairly well documented. Uh, origin still unclear, but plenty of ideas around. Some of them are rather weird. I think someone suggested comets crashing onto neutron stars. Yes, there's one of the possible <laughs> mechanisms. That strikes me being highly improbable, I may say. Well, it was put forward fairly seriously, and there have been other suggestions like supernovae and galaxies and giant flares, bigger versions of what we get on the sun, and that sort of thing. Well, we've learned a lot about gamma ray astronomy in the fairly recent past, and I say, you are a gamma ray astronomer, and I am not. Where do you think it's going to get us, and what is the future of gamma ray astronomy? Well, I think it's got past the sort of ex uh, the searching stage now, and getting into the exploring stage. We now have some idea of what sort of sources there are in the yeah. sky, and we're looking for more of them yeah. and studying them in detail. We'd like to know more about the emission from the Milky Way, because that will tell us a lot about the cosmic rays that are there. We might well get gamma rays from neutron stars and from black holes, because they've both got strong gravity. What about the gaseous nebulae, Messier 42, the horse's head, and so on? Yes, the dark nebulae, like the horse head nebulae, could well be a gamma ray source, and a particularly interesting one, because it would be a line emission, a spectral line what would happen was the cosmic rays interacting with the dust that makes the nebula dark. And the gamma rays that would be produced would be characteristic of the material of the dust. And by seeing what energy they were, you could tell what the dust was, which would be very nice. I was interested also, if you're speaking about black holes and gamma rays, because after all, black holes, again, are so revolutionary. Do you seriously think they can be gamma ray sources? I think they might be. Uh, did you realize that black holes aren't in fact black? Yes, I did indeed. Mm. Stephen Hawking's work. Stephen Hawking's work, yes. What happens is that a gamma ray can emit just a little bit of radiation. And the amount it, emit, the amount it emits depends on how heavy it is. In fact, the lighter it is, the more it emits, which makes it very interesting because when it emits, it gets lighter, yes. so it emits more. So it gets lighter still, so it emits more. A kind of runaway effect, in fact. Exactly, yes. This black hole is going to evaporate and it's going to evaporate faster and faster to go at the end and that or spurt at the end is all gamma rays i just wonder where it's going to lead us you know i think you would agree that gamma ray astronomy really has got an exciting future yes lots to come what do you think is going to happen in the immediate future within the next two or three years any ideas oh i hope lots of interesting things but i think only a fool would try and pretend <laughs> what there are so many different directions it could go in all of them exciting. Well, after all, gamma ray astronomy is really new. Well, I hope that we'll come back and do another program about it in a few years, because when we started this Sky at Night series of ours, just about 21 years ago, we couldn't have done a program about gamma ray astronomy because it didn't then exist. It was something entirely unforeseen, unexpected. And I think we've learned a great deal since then. And uh, I think the really exciting days are in store. So um, let's hope we learn a lot more about these extraordinary radiations.